In this SY2 screencast, we're going to have a look at the role of the experimental method in sociology. Now, normally when sociologists are creating primary data, so new information, uh, they use one of two broad approaches. They either watch people, so they use various types of observation, or alternatively they ask people questions, and there are different techniques for doing that. So sociologists watch people, they ask people questions, but also there's a third way of doing research. They also meddle. And what I mean by this is that the researcher might choose to change or manipulate uh, an aspect of their participants' environment in order to assess the effect on their behaviour. And this, in very simple terms, is what we mean by an experiment. Now, thinking back to your science lessons at school, you'll be familiar with the laboratory experimental approach. So laboratory experiments are done in controlled conditions, and they're the classic method of the natural sciences. So, for example, let's say that we wanted to do a really simple experiment on how light affects plant growth. So we might make the prediction that if you restrict uh, a plant light, then you restrict its growth. Now, the method that we would use to test that prediction would be to take two very similar plants, put one in light and the other in darkness. And obviously, if we do that within the closed environment of the laboratory, we can keep all of the other factors that might affect plant growth, moisture, heat, soil type, etc. We can keep all of those things constant. And therefore, if we observe any differences uh, in the rate of plant growth, we can be pretty confident that that's down to uh, the light because we've isolated that factor. So experiments begin with a prediction of how one factor will affect another. And the technical term for this prediction is a hypothesis. So in the very simple experiment that I've just described, this is our hypothesis. If you restrict a plant's light, you restrict its growth. So one factor uh, causes another. And in an experiment, the causal factor that you are manipulating, so the thing that you are changing, which in our case was the, uh, the amount of light that plants were exposed to, technically this causal factor is known as our independent variable, or simply abbreviated as our IV. Our dependent variable is the factor that is affected by the independent variable. So in our simple experiment, plant growth is the dependent variable because that's the factor that we predicted is going to be affected by the light. Now in the social sciences, a laboratory experiment normally involves a researcher asking for volunteers who are then invited along to the researcher's chosen setting, uh, an artificially created environment, in order to take part uh, in the experiment. And of course the potential benefit of doing it uh, in an artificially created environment is you can control the variables. So in the pictures that you can see, uh, variables such as lighting and temperature are kept the same for all participants. The only difference is the noise level. So if there are differences in memory, which correlate with differences in noise level, then this suggests that noise affects memory. Now the example that I've just given, the example that you can see in the cartoon, is actually from psychology rather than sociology. And there's a reason for that. Okay? In sociology, the laboratory experiment method, for reasons that we go into in a moment, is not a very popular method. Okay, it's hardly ever used, although it is used uh, a lot more in psychology. Now, despite their unpopularity in sociology, laboratory experiments do have uh, a number of potential advantages. As I've just highlighted, you can control uh, the variables much more than you can do in an open environment. Uh, experiments are one of the most reliable ways of doing research, so you can uh, carry out uh, the same kind of research in exactly the same way and if you get 
similar results, then you can be more confident about the reliability of your data. And also experiments enable us to measure uh, the relationship between uh, the independent and the dependent variable in quite precise ways. However, as I've just noted, laboratory experiments are very much a minority method in sociology. So most sociologists argue that there are a, a number of really serious weaknesses to this approach uh, that make this method uh, inappropriate for a subject like sociology. For example, many sociologists argue that one of the main problems with laboratory experiments is they lack ecological validity. And what this means is that because experiments take place in artificial situations, they don't necessarily reflect how people would actually behave in a real life setting in their natural environment. There can also be ethical problems with certain types of experiments. So some people object to the idea of experimenting on people, particularly if the experimental situation uh, causes harm or distress. You've also got practical problems with the use of experiments in a subject like sociology. So sociology is a subject that's often interested in large populations, in large social groups, and it's interested in social change. And obviously it's impractical to conduct laboratory experiments on large numbers of people or over a long period of time. Now, in the previous screencast, I talked about two different approaches to doing research called positivism and interpretivism. And positivism, remember, is the idea that sociology should follow the principles and logic of the natural sciences. So positivism, I think, would be an approach that would be in favour of experimental designs in sociological research. Interpretivism, on the other hand, remember, rejects the idea that sociology should be modelled on the natural sciences. And interpretivists would argue that experiments are not a useful method in sociology uh, at all. Their argument would be that people are very different from the usual subject matter of experiments, such as chemicals and plants. And the key difference is that people have consciousness, and they usually know that they're taking part in an experiment. Uh, and because of this knowledge, their performance may therefore uh, be distorted by their desire to impress the experimenter. Because of the numerous problems that I've highlighted, when sociologists do choose to carry out experiments, they're normally outside of the laboratory. And such experiments are known as field experiments, and they involve... Uh, the sociologists uh, intervening in the social world in such a way that hypotheses can be tested by isolating particular variables. So normally in a field experiment, the researcher will seek to change uh, a particular aspect of their participants' natural environment in order to measure the effect. However, if the participants are uh, aware that their behaviour is being studied, this may obviously alter their behaviour. And this is what you can see in the cartoon uh, on this particular screen. So this is based on a famous field experiment uh, conducted at the Hawthorne Works at the Western Electricity Company in Chicago. And the object of this experiment was to test various hypotheses about worker pro productivity. And what they did during the course of this field experiment is they manipulated variables that they predicted might affect worker productivity, such as room temperature, uh, the strength of the lighting, uh, the length of the breaks. But what they found was irrespective of whether working conditions were improved or made worse, productivity, so how hard the workers were working, usually increased. And it appeared that the workers were actually responding to the knowledge that an experiment was taking place rather than to the variables being manipulated. So what sociology textbooks call the Hawthorne effect is the behaviour that results from people's awareness that they're part of an experiment and are being observed. Another sociological alternative to the laboratory experiment is something called the comparative method. Uh, 
And this is an approach to doing research that involves the same logic as the experimental approach, but using events that have already taken place, rather than creating artificial situations. So social groups, times or places are systematically compared to try to isolate variables in the same way that we would do uh, in a laboratory experiment. And this is quite a useful method uh, for situations where it's simply impractical or unethical to use experiments. So this is much more widely used than laboratory experiments in sociology. And really the classic example of the comparative method in sociology is Durkheim's famous study of suicide. OK, in the next few screencasts we're going to look at the more mainstream methods that sociologists use in order to gather primary data. And we're going to start by looking at observational methods in the next presentation.